One of the methods of what you might call guerrilla marketing that I've used to expose people to my ideas is to get into YouTube videos where one of Matthew Franklin Whittier's major plagiarists is discussed, say Edgar Allan Poe or Charles Dickens, and in particular the pieces that they stole from Matthew, uh, Christmas Carol or The Raven and so on, Annabelle Lee, and leave posts, comments underneath the video with links to my work. And uh, some two or three years ago, I had started putting links to the videos that I had made about the evidence that Edgar Allan Poe stole the raven from Matthew. And I, I don't know how often they're visited, but I don't think very often. And almost never does anyone make a comment under them. On rare occasions, one of the presenters, if it's like a lecture, the presenter will make a comment. So recently, I've gone back in, and just a little bit at a time, I'm replacing those links to the videos with links to my papers, the articles that I've written. And while I was doing that, I noticed that one presenter, lecturer, in particular, had left a message. Now, there was another one that left a sarcastic message, and I just left a message under it. You know, in, in my incarnation as Matthew Franklin Whittier, I was a satirist. In this incarnation, I'm doing something almost the opposite. I'll take somebody's sarcasm and I'll write a straight answer to it, you know, which, you know, it's kind of an interesting effect. Um, but the first, the first one was sarcastic and I just made a straight answer to it. And, but the second one sounded sincere is something to the effect that he felt that my evidence was weak. And this is what I'd like to talk about today. I don't have any notes. I haven't prepared anything. I just thought a little bit about how I wanted to get into this. I did write a, a written blog entry about this recently, but I think I want to explore it in front of the camera. This could be long. This could be short. It could be insightful. It could be the same old stuff, you know, but I've run across this before. People that should be open-minded, people who should be in some cases, not offended by reincarnation. They should be knowledgeable, and yet they'll disappointingly come back to me where they should have been really impressed, in other words, and they won't give me that wow factor. You know, none of them are impressed. To a man or woman, not a single one of them is impressed. Sometimes they don't have time to look at it. Um, sometimes they just think it's interesting, and why don't you write a paper? you know, uh, which is kind of a way of dismissing me, I think. Sometimes they're just, just not impressed, you know. Uh, the, the evidence seem, is weak. But the evidence isn't weak, see, so that's not logical. It's not rational. And these, these are from highly intelligent people who should be rational, see, and they're not being rational. They're taking what's excellent evidence, strong evidence, paradigm-shifting, transforming evidence, and they're saying it's weak, and they're not impressed, and they never follow up on it, and they don't want to read my materials in depth, you know, and I don't know quite what to do with that. So that's what I want to talk about. I just want to explore. And it's too bad we don't have like a Zoom discussion, you know, it would be kind of interesting if I knew that there was people that were really sincere and sincerely interested in this, I would set up a Zoom live discussion and let's talk about that. What is this about my evidence that doesn't look strong, you know, it looks weak? Why do I not get that wow factor from anybody, seemingly? And I did recently. I just did a podcast with a, the, the name of the podcast is Everything Imaginable. The link is in my updates page on my website. I'm sure you know my website. It's www.ial.goldthread.com. Go to the navigation bar on the left and click on updates, news and updates, and you will see the link to that podcast. There's another one I'm going to do on July 20 which gets posted a week later or whatever. He was impressed, but um, this is somebody that's kind of very, very open-minded. It's like he's professionally open-minded, you know. Um, but will it go anywhere, you know? That's... So I, I thought I'd explore that. So what are the possible explanations, you know? Well, first of all, there's the possibility that I'm self-delusional. You know, I looked at that, you know, of course I would look at that. I do have a master's in counseling, 
And keep in mind that in order for me to be presenting this kind of information based on being delusion, delusional, I would have to be extremely delusional. Just like if this was a hoax, I would have to be practically a sociopath to pull off a hoax of this magnitude, to be just flat out lying and making this up. And I think you can look at me and see I probably don't have the personality that would fit with someone who would perpetrate that degree of a hoax. And why? Because I'm totally ignored. I don't get anything out of it. You know, I've ruined my chances for getting a job, basically, because of my internet presence. You know, and I don't get anything out of it. I don't sell any books. I don't get any fame. You know, <laughs> why would I bother? Why would I do this? It's like kamikaze, you know. So it's not a hoax. As far as delusion is concerned, well, again, I mean, I'm not the type. And I have a master's degree for what it's worth. If I'm this badly delusional, and I would have to be extremely delusional in order to be fooling myself about these kinds of things, that I was the past life author of The Raven, for example. I'd have to be totally wacko. And, I mean, how many of these videos have I done? Do I look totally wacko to you? Maybe, you know, but I don't think so. No, that's not the answer. Uh, especially when I have the evidence and people won't look at the evidence. And when they look at the evidence, they pronounce it weak when it's actually strong. Okay. So, you know, I mean, this evidence I have, which proves beyond any reasonable doubt that the historical character, the writer, Matthew Franklin Whittier, left clues to posterity that Edgar Allan Poe was a fake, that he was an, you know, an imposter, literary imposter and an imitator, and that he did not write The Raven, and that Matthew was the real author of The Raven. I've got so many that would only take one or two, and I have maybe 15 or 16 or 20 of these clues that Matthew left. So I can flat out prove that Matthew Franklin Whittier, the historical character, told posterity that Poe did not write The Raven and that he was the author. And yet people will say that evidence is weak. Well, there's also the whole question of denial. I, I understand hero worship. If somebody came out with some horrible dirt on Roger Federer, who I admire very much, I'm a Roger Federer fan, and I don't permit myself too many idols, but uh, I, I do admire him. Um, if somebody came out with some horrible dirt on him, I would have trouble swallowing it. You know, I would, I would kick it out, at least initially. It would, it would upset me greatly. And then I would have to try to investigate it. But my first reaction would be, I don't believe that, you know. Well, I understand that. Um, and it's up to each person to decide how dedicated they are to the truth to face transformative facts, you know. I mean, that's with each perceiver. That's with each person listening or looking at my evidence to decide for themselves, am I willing to be transformed by the truth or not? And if I'm not willing to be transformed by the truth and I go into denial, that's kind of, that's that person's lookout. That's nothing I can do anything about. As they say, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. It's not my responsibility to make all these horses drink water. It's only my responsibility to bring the truth to them. And, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm kind of looking at percentages. And as I mentioned in a recent entry, the percentages are looking a lot worse than what I anticipated. I would anticipate somewhere between 95 and 98 percent to go into denial and refuse to look at my evidence because it's too threatening or too far out. Or, you know, because we all know that Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol and we all know that Edgar Allan Poe wrote The Raven and that we all know means social validation. And the vast majority of people in the population have not gotten past looking to social validation for their reality. I mean, that's the truth of it. It's a stage. And 98% or 95% of the people in the world establish their reality, their worldview, based on or largely informed by social validation. If you violate social validation then by definition for that 95% or 98%, you are crazy because that's their definition of reality. Does everybody else sign in on it or not? See, and if everybody else doesn't sign in on it, therefore, ipso facto, you are crazy. See, 
So I don't pay any attention to that because I have evolved, like many people, beyond the point where I rely on social validation for my reality. I want to know directly, you know. There's, I have different sources for my reality, um, which I don't know if I need to go into that. My sources for reality are uh, objective uh, inquiry, which means both the scientific method and what I would call forensic methods, you know, of uh, investigation, logical inquiry and testing. And I also rely on those individuals whom I believe had obtained a very high level of spiritual uh, evolving uh, attainment such that they were directly in touch with reality as it is. Those are God-realized or self-realized beings and on a slightly lower tier, the people who can see God directly, the saints. And uh, this is based on my 45-year discipleship to Mayor Baba, who I believe to be one of those people who had attained Gnosis. Uh, so that's my other source of reality testing, you know. Does it fit with what my guru and the other spiritual masters on that level of attainment have said? And can it, does it test out, you know? So I don't really care what society says because those sources are far beyond society. I also don't care what uh, peer-reviewed journals say because that's another form of social validation, only a smaller, more select group. See, but I've been into those uh, professor profiles in the universities, and I've seen where they're coming from and uh, the assumptions that they base their work on and what they're interested in. And it's a very mixed bag. There's a lot of ignorant people who are sounding erudite in uh, academia. And when I say ignorant, I mean spiritually ignorant. If I put what they're teaching up against what these God-realized teachers are teaching, there's no comparison. They're way off the beam, see? So if, you know, I'm not really impressed by social validation in academia where that means getting your papers accepted in the review process and then getting them published in a scholarly journal and getting reviews and getting people to agree as a whole, the academic community to uh, applaud or boo, you know, I'm not impressed by that either because frankly, I'm not that impressed by the overall, I don't, I don't mean certain individuals, but the overall academic community does not impress me. They're very spiritually ignorant these people. Um, Matthew Franklin Whittier saw it the same way. He did satires on this. He created a character named Dr. E. Gertie Digg, who was a caricature of academic philosophers and academia in general. And uh, I have said that the higher mind does not change that much from one incarnation to the other. I have Matthew's same higher mind, which I have objectively demonstrated in the talk that I reposted recently, which some 13 people have seen at this point. It's a two-hour talk, so I don't know how many people have watched all of it, but um, the reason that got reposted is that I am in touch with a religion professor who is familiar with Eastern philosophy. He was referred to me by a priest, um, who a Jesuit priest, and I have always been under the impression that the Jesuits were fairly intellectual, so I thought normally I wouldn't write to a priest, see, about reincarnation, but I thought, well, let's let's try this guy because he's a Jesuit, so he's probably well educated. I'm sure he's familiar intellectually with the topic, you know, in the literature. And I wrote to him, and he says, "Well, I fully believe that you're sincere. I'm just paraphrasing from memory, but I don't really know what to do with this." And the inference was he didn't know what to do with it internally as well as you know externally. So he passed me off to this other religion professor who has written about reincarnation, including Dr. Stevenson's work and so on. Well, he seemed to be very ambivalent, and I talked to him on the phone. He was reluctant to talk to me on the phone, but he kind of dutifully did, and I tried to give my spiel, you know, and a short, you know, a short version, and he didn't have a lot to say, And but you can feel it when you're talking to somebody that doesn't believe you, you know, that's skeptical. You can just feel the skepticism oozing through the phone, you know, from the other side. And I read his papers completely and commented on them. He apparently is reading mine, 
And he's, I mentioned this talk that I gave to the Jung Society, the uh, Jung Group in Brunswick. I thought that'd give me a little credibility, A, and B, it talks specifically about this issue of the higher mind being the same. I objectively compare Matthew Franklin Whittier's higher mind with my own, and the way I do that is very simple. I take pieces that I wrote uh, from before I could ever have read Matthew's work, not necessarily before I ever found out about him, but before I read his essays and travelogues and things where he gave his uh, his worldview, see. And I compared that with his own works, with Matthew's own works, and I compared them on several parameters, including humor and values and specific intellectual concepts and, you know, worldview and so on. And it, it's, a, it's a complete 100% match, I would say, except that Matthew was convinced about St. Paul, and I'm convinced he was a con artist, so I totally disagree with Matthew, my former self, on that. There's a few things like the use of satire that I have changed my views on. I'm much more careful about satire. I'm much less likely to use it because it tends to degenerate into a gunfight where the person on the other side is not using satire in service of the truth. He or she is using satire in service of his or her ego as to two totally different things. It looks similar, but it's polar opposites. So if you get into a satirical shooting match, when you're trying to uphold what you see as the truth and the other person has no dedication to the truth at all and is just defending their ego and basically indulging in sophistry, then it's a lost cause. I mean, I've done that in this life too. And it's, you know, you're, you're playing their game and it's just useless. They, they have no respect for the truth whatsoever. So if you are able to prove something that's true, you know, even if you're able to back them into a corner logically, at that point, they'll just find some excuse to scoot out. Well, we've talked long enough. See, so there's no winning against a person like that. So I use satire and sarcasm a lot less. Otherwise, it's the same higher mind, and I demonstrated it in that talk, objectively. So I, I was trying to refer him to that, this religion professor, and he came back and says, it's, it's not there. It's not posted. And the inference, the feeling I got from that was that, see, I know you're fake because your video isn't even on there. I don't think he even consciously was thinking that, but he was relieved. You know, oh, you're, you know, you're not real. Your video isn't even posted. There's no video there. Well, it so happened that that had somehow dropped off the map on YouTube. I don't know how. I won't point fingers or try to, you know, think of any nefarious scenario in which it could have been deleted. I have no idea. So I just reposted it, and it stuck. Uh, YouTube didn't kick it out for any reason, so I don't think that YouTube got rid of it before. You know, I don't know why it disappeared. But anyway, it's on there again, and that's why it's toward the top of my list, and some of you have at least dipped into it, if not watched the whole thing. Again, that's objective evidence that my higher mind and Matthew Franklin Whittier's higher mind are the same mind. It hasn't died. It hasn't changed. It's it's morphed a little bit because of the differences between me and Matthew, you know, but not much. When I read Matthew's work, I can still feel myself writing those pieces. The creative process. I remember the creative process of writing. I remember what I was trying to get across, why I was trying to get across, what my motives were, what my hidden motives were. You know, it's all there because it's that kind of memory is not wiped out from one incarnation to another. It remains constant. So uh, that person hasn't really given me feedback. He seems so reluctant that, that I haven't gotten feedback from him yet. It's been a few days now. So the wow factor is still missing. Now, whether it'll show up or not, because the, here's the thing, it's so extreme. My discovery is so extreme. And I'm not saying this to brag, it's an extreme discovery. If it's real, you know, having remembered who I was in the 19th century, discovered buried evidence, deeply buried evidence, that in my past life I actually had an 
pretty amazing literary career that spanned 50 years and started as a child prodigy. And that I was actually responsible for some of the works that made a number of plagiarists famous. It means that the entire history of literature in the 19th century, American, but also to some extent English, is going to have to be rewritten, completely rewritten, because Charles Dickens didn't write A Christmas Carol. And Edgar Allan Poe did not write The Raven or Annabelle Lee. And these were scoundrels. You know, <laughs> these were scoundrels. These were not admirable people, unless you admire Edgar Allan Poe as a sociopath and how tricky he was and the uh, horrible science fictionish, you know, gothic stories that he wrote. If you admire that, that was him, you know, uh, the ones that he wrote, that is, which I don't think he wrote all of them. Margaret Fuller, the great transcendentalist, did not write the reviews signed F in the Transcendentalist magazine, The Dial, the first two years. That was Matthew. She did not write the star-signed reviews and essays in the New York Tribune from fall of 1844 to mid-1846, with a few exceptions where she stuck her thumb in and overwrote what Matthew had written. Uh, for example, to make Elizabeth Barrett look good instead of Matthew's critical review. And when Matthew left the paper toward the end, she may have written two or three or four of the last ones. And then she kept that signature and wrote from overseas as the paper's foreign correspondent. That was her. But she, from 1844 in the fall until at least mid-1846, she didn't write those star signed reviews. That's the biggest part of her legacy that people praise. See, not counting her feminist work. Apparently that was hers, her, her talk about, uh, about early feminism. So you'd have to cut her legacy down to that and take away all the rest of it. See, that's totally going to rewrite history. Um, and then as far as Elizabeth Barrett Browning is concerned, the ones that she got famous for, like Lady Geraldine's Courtship, Wine of Cyprus, those were not hers, those were Matthews. And not only were they Matthews, they were deeply personal poems about his courtship with Abby, her tutoring him, and other things that had to do with his deeply personal life. And suddenly they come to life when you understand who wrote them, under what circumstances, and what they were actually about. They were not written in imagination, you know, by anybody. The Raven was not written in imagination by anybody. And A Christmas Carol was not a ghost story. <laughs> and Margaret Fuller, the, the, the lazy egotist, did not write all of those reviews, those star sign reviews. See? So it's going to take a, a, a drastic rewrite. And then you've got the things that Matthew wrote that did not become famous. Other things that were plagiarized by people that nobody's paid too much attention to because, you know, the, the people they're attributed to were no great shakes. See, if they understood who wrote them, in other words, if they understood that the real author of The Raven and the real co-author of A Christmas Carol wrote these other works, they suddenly would start paying attention. As it is, the books which are um, attributed to Asa Green are going for thousands of dollars, but nobody knows who wrote them. They, they deprecate Asa Green's humor, even though they're excellent humorous works. And uh, they don't have much respect for Asa Green, but for some weird reason, his books are very expensive, see? You know, there's some possible other reasons for that, because one of them has to do with Wall Street, and it's the first written account of Wall Street that was ever made in the United States, and that drives the price up. But the other ones are expensive, too, five, six, seven hundred dollars $700, you know? And who's Asa Green, and why are his books so expensive, see? Because they're so good, you know. Well, then there's other works that nobody's paid any attention to. They're just as good as those famous ones that Matthew wrote. And all that's going to have to be explored. So this is a huge discovery. So come back to the question, when I can prove these things, when I have smoking guns for these things, I have smoking guns regarding the Raven and one smoking gun regarding Annabelle Lee and some smoking guns regarding A Christmas Carol and likewise the other ones. You've just seen some that I presented in the last two or three entries concerning Elizabeth Barrett Browning. There's smoking guns in there, including the fact that she could not possibly have written all those star sign reviews because in one of them, the reviewer mentions he was born in the winter, which is impossible for Margaret Fuller. And as I said, it's also impossible for Matthew, except Matthew 
purposely would lie about his birthday to throw people off. In in one case, he threw it to the the entertainer that rumor had developed that uh, Ashen Dodge was the author of the Quails series, travelogue series in the Boston Weekly Museum that ran from fall of 1849 to mid-1852. Rumor developed, for reasons I don't need to get into now, that Ashen Dodge was the author. He was not. When Matthew wrote about it, he was deeply undercover for the abolitionist cause. He actually threw the authorship to Ashen Dodge by hinting that Ashen Dodge's birthday was his birthday, the writer, see? So he did this little birthday trick before. Well, he did the same thing in the New York Tribune. He inferred that he had Horace Greeley's birthday, that it was Horace Greeley writing because he talked about his birthday in the winter and Horace Greeley, the editor-in-chief, was born in February sometime. But he made it clear that Margaret Fuller was not the author. See, I think that was his purpose there. He just wanted to make it clear to posterity that, no, it's not Fuller. You can attribute this to Horace Greeley if you want to, but not this woman, you know. Um, so I proved that. That's a smoking gun. There should be a wow factor here somewhere, you know. <clears throat> Somebody should say, this is not magical thinking because this guy's got the evidence. It, he's not self-deluded. That can't be the explanation because, I mean, even if he is crazy, he's still got the damn evidence, you know. <laughs> and so him being self-delusional is irrelevant at this point, you know. Uh, it's irrelevant because he's actually got the evidence. So who cares if he's crazy or not? <laughs> so where is the wow factor? Because... It should be there. Why are people who have the necessary acumen, who have the credentials, who have studied these things, who on some level have to know that I'm right, what is it with this weak evidence business? You know, I mean, you can say it's denial and you can say it's convenient for them, you know, I mean, if somebody came to me and said Roger Federer was a scoundrel, and I'd say, oh, that's weak evidence. Even if they had strong evidence, I'd say, I don't believe it. Your evidence is weak, you know. That would last for a little while. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work for me personally. It might put off the other person, you know. I would know that I was worried about it, deeply worried about it, and that I would have to look into it, see. So I'm assuming there's a certain amount of that going on where people tell me that it's weak evidence by way of dismissing me and keeping me at arm's length. But then they get worried and they go in and they read the whole article. I do see some of that because I can see the stats. I can see the stats for how many people have downloaded a paper. And if I want to, I can narrow that down by source because I can name the file slightly differently. So, for example, on my updates page, I can name the, the file concerning Dickens and the Christmas Carol one way. And when I post it on YouTube, I can name it another way. And then when I get the download stats, I, I know how many came from this source and how many came from that source. I could do that. I haven't really bothered. But if I, if I want to break it down like that, I can. On Academia EDU, you see how many pages the person has read. You know, you see whether they downloaded it or not. And if they're part of the Academia EDU system, since I'm on the paid tour, you see everything, their name, their picture, the whole blast, you know, what college they work for, everything, which is TMI, in my opinion, but I do see it. So I see some evidence that the very people who refuse to give me the satisfaction, and this is the thing, people's egos are such that the, they would rather die than give me the satisfaction of having discovered something significant. That's what I gather, you know, because partly because they're envious. I think some of this is professional envy. They would like to be the person who discovered that Charles Dickens didn't write A Christmas Carol. Who, who is this guy? Who is this gadfly that's not even part of academia, that is, isn't a professor, that hasn't submitted any of his work to journals? Who is this guy to discover this thing that's going to blow the top off literary history and, and make history? You know, I would like to be that person. And there is, in fact, one professor who, after I went public with my discoveries about Charles Dickens and the Christmas Carol, 
came up with a theory that's a little bit similar. And her theory is that Charles Dickens, when he was visiting America, got a tour of a progressive factory in Lowell, Massachusetts, and they gave him one of their journals. The mill workers, the girls, put together their own journal, and they gave him a copy. And some of the stories in there are a little bit similar to A Christmas Carol, and she says he thinks he, she thinks that he drew on that uh, to write A Christmas Carol. And that was a very controversial um, theory, and apparently she's got quite a nice little career out of it, or at least at least her career doesn't seem to have suffered from that now. She never wrote me back. I wrote to her recently, giving her the link to this article that I wrote. She didn't write back. But I had corresponded with her some years ago, and she knows very well who I am and what my theory is. And we established at that time two things. The first was we established that I was first publicly. I went public with mine before she went public with hers. That's a matter of record, and I have the correspondence still. I've saved it. And the second one was that she would not cite me because she says my work wasn't relevant enough to hers, which was BS. You know, that was dishonest on her part, in my opinion, because it's clearly relevant, especially since I was first, you know. And had she done the honorable thing and cited me, then there would have been interest in my work. You know, I would have been uh, brought to the attention of any number of scholars. See, but she deliberately withheld that citation on an excuse, and therefore nobody's ever heard of me now. So this is some of the politics that enters into academic work, see. Another aspect of that politics is that I would never get published in any scholarly journal because the reviewers would do something similar. See, the reviewers would refu refuse to sign off on it for personal and political reasons, not because the evidence wasn't good and the paper wasn't well written. See? I know that ahead of time. This is like Charlie Brown and the football, you know. These professors, including the most recent one I talked to, they all say, why don't you submit to scholarly journals? You know, well, this is kind of like Lucy saying, come on, I'll hold the ball for you this time. You know, well, no way. I, I know, you know, what's going to happen. And I've tested it out because Academia EDU sent along an automated invitation to all of its people who are subscribing to their service to submit a 1600 word essay, you know, a paper. And that same day I sat down and I wrote one on a fairly significant topic. I mean, this is a major discovery in the world of academia. Anything new is major, basically. If you can come up with anything that nobody else has thought of, that's major. Well, I happen to know that Matthew Franklin Whittier was the real anonymous author of an anti-slavery novel called The Rag Picker or Bound and Free, which was published in I think Boston in 1855. And that his longtime plagiarist, George Pickering Burnham, tried to associate his name with it by nefarious means. It's a long story. It's kind of interesting. He had money, so he bought a book publisher in Boston and uh, Fetterhen and Company, and he made it Burnham, Fetterhen and Company. And two months after uh, the rag picker was published, I think it was published in New York, two months after it was published, George Burnham takes out an ad in Boston, I think it was the Boston Herald, and he announces this book with his name as the author. See? And then he gets interviewed by a couple people for a couple different newspapers, the Boston Herald and the True Flag. And they say, oh, the, the mystery of who wrote the rag picker has now been revealed. And it was George Burnham, see? Well, George Burnham is credited with other work he had previously stolen from Matthew. So he had a kind of a track record, but it wasn't his work. See, it was Matthew's work. Well, that didn't fly because I only found like a few announcements for a very short period and all within Boston. So it didn't work. But what happened was that uh, years later, in the 1892 or something like that, somebody who was compiling uh, a history of Massachusetts, I think it was, came across this information. And when they had their little paragraph about George Burnham, 
they included the fact that he was the author of the rag picker. Now move forward until the, to the 1900s and 1956 or something like that, and somebody writes a bibliography of the 19th century. They found this previous little bio sketch, and they listed George Burnham as the author of the rag picker. See? And then move forward to present time. Some librarian got hold of an antiquarian copy, and she found these references, including the one from 1956, say, the dates are approximate here from memory. And she penciled George Burnham's name in as the author. So then what happens, she digitizes, or that library digitizes that book. And they send digital copies to all the other libraries with George Burnham's name penciled on the cover, see, as the author. So all the libraries now list George Burnham as the author of this book, an anonymous book, which is completely implausible for George Burnham if you find out who he really was. He was a con artist. Uh, so then the people that print these antiquarian books on demand, they print new copies on demand, presumably for universities, they list George Burnham prominently on the cover as the author now because all the libraries said that he was the author. Now, I've got evidence, strong evidence, that Matthew Franklin Whittier was the real author and not this con artist character, George Burnham. Well, I wrote that up and I managed to put that in 1,600 words, everything I've just said. I got into 1,600 words exactly to the word and I submitted it. And Academia EDU's software tells you to expect the reviewing process that should take one or two weeks, you know, the reviewing process to get it to reviewers and get their feedback. Well, that was a month and a half ago. I haven't heard anything. If I go into the software, they'll let you look at a page where it's automatically, you know, you see the progress and it's still stuck on looking for reviewers or seeking reviewers or something like that. It's stuck there. So whether everybody's paper is stuck there, whether the whole idea just fell through the cracks because it was just one person's idea and then nobody else supported it and it just died and they haven't bothered to tell me that it died, or whether mine in particular is being held up by somebody that is feverishly looking, you know, checking up on all of my sources, finding them accurate, and still refusing to give me that wow factor, still refusing to give me the satisfaction. He will not let me get the credit for this discovery, you know. And he can't quite figure out how to get the credit for it himself, to steal it, because I've already published. <laughs> so he's just going to sit on it, I guess. That's speculation. I don't know what's going on. But what it, it was a test case for me. And what it tells me is, I'm absolutely right. This is Charlie Brown with the football, Lucy and Charlie Brown and the football. They are never going to give me the satisfaction. They are never going to give me the time of day. They're never going to give me that wow factor. And they're never going to publish anything that I submit to a scholarly journal. Unless, unless somebody breaks the ice. If somebody breaks rank and does, then everybody's going to rush on board because they don't want to be left behind. This is a major historical discovery. You know, they don't want to be left behind. Here, Charles Dickens didn't write a Christmas carol, and my journal isn't talking about it. Of course they have to talk about it. So all it takes is one, see? But I have yet to get that one. And I'm talking about people who are experts in the field of reincarnation, whom I will not name, experts who are uh, in the field of consciousness studies, nationally known figures. I, occasionally I get like one or two lines back from these people, or sometimes a little more. They're too busy. All of these people are too busy for someone who has flat out proved an adult case with some very interesting research implications, such as the ones that I talked about in my, in my uh, talk for the Jungians. They're all too busy for this, see? Um, so there again, no wow factor. Not going to give me the satisfaction of having discovered something that's really significant. Right? Uh, so it may boil down to just that ego defense that they're not going to give me the satisfaction of having discovered something important because they want to be the discoverer of that. Or they're just not going to admit 
that some nobody has discovered something that they had 150 years to discover and never guessed at. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, in my written blog, and I'll wrap this up with this, in my written blog, I was giving people the benefit of the doubt. And what I said is, it's true that it's all too new for somebody that's just being confronted with this. They don't have any place to hang it. They don't have any context. Uh, it doesn't make sense because they don't have the background. So if you're just presented with these smoking guns and nothing else, and this goes for the reincarnation experts as well, if you're just presented with the smoking guns in, in the reincarnation end, the smoking guns would be things that prove that it's a real case. You know, I remembered very detailed idiosyncratic things before I could ever possibly have seen them in the historical record. And then I went into the deep historical record and I showed that those things were correct. You know, that's evidence. I should be getting a wow factor out of that. And I don't. It's withheld from me. I don't know. That's weak evidence. I, you know, well, maybe because they don't have the context. All the other hits that I made, everything else that I've discovered about Matthew Franklin Whitty or all the parallels between his higher mind and mine, you know, because they don't have time to listen to that or to read that, see. So it's a catch-22, as I said in my written blog. They won't take the time to go in and read my entire study. So they don't have the deep context. All they have time for is a few smoking guns. When I present those smoking guns, they're not convincing because they don't have the context. See? And they refuse to go get the context. Well, theoretically, what should happen when I present the smoking guns, that should trigger enough of a wow response that they now have the motivation to go back in and look at the whole context and read the entire study. That doesn't happen because they're too busy. And maybe they are and maybe they aren't. Too busy is a matter of priorities, you know. I mean, if I can prove a past life and I've got 50 years of literary work from my past life that I could not possibly have ever known about before I started the research. And if in this past life, I actually was the real co-author of A Christmas Carol and the real author of The Raven, which means that I can now take reincarnation and insert it into other areas of academia, which means that I'm now challenging uh, the paradigm of philosophical materialism in the literature departments of all the universities in the world, English speaking ones, if not others, you know, they have time for this. <laughs> if they took it seriously for half a half a half a half a half a half a second, they have time for this. They can set aside anything they're doing for this because not to brag, but this is significant, you know. Uh, so there's some disconnect somewhere. And then I've got weird little things like my email suddenly stops working and there's, a, there's apparently an indication that my Cloudflare account was hacked from somebody in Ukraine, given the IP address. And the fact that this evidential talk to the unions was deleted from my YouTube account, because this one gives me credibility. They paid me, I've got the check here up on the wall. They paid me $195 to talk to the main Jung Center in Brunswick for two hours. They probably would not have paid $195 to someone who was completely delusional. They might have, but they were happy with it. <laughs> they asked questions. There was maybe 20 people present. They were happy. They asked questions. They were pleased with the, with the talk. They paid me and thanked me for it. You know, if I was totally delusional, these, I mean, a lot of these people are psychotherapists. If I was totally delusional, they might have accidentally let me in to their schedule, but they wouldn't have been happy. <laughs> so, so that conveniently got deleted off of my YouTube account somehow. I don't know how. So some weird stuff kind of showing up, see. Well, I don't know where this is going to go. Um, I don't know if I'll ever get that wow factor. I don't know if anybody will ever give me the satisfaction. But I suspect that if one journal breaks ranks, 
or one world expert breaks rank breaks ranks that's all it's going to take because the other ones are going to have to jump on the bandwagon at least to to, to fight it if not to defend it because they don't want to be left behind with something this significant with a discovery this significant see so it just takes the one to break ranks who's got the balls because it could destroy this person's career it could destroy their family if their wife isn't on board with it you know a lot of times when like the husband does embraces something like this the wife leaves him so he could be without a career not able to get a job uh, his wife might leave him. He might be destitute. He might be ridiculed by his colleagues. This is what's at stake for anybody who's in the system who dares champion anything that I'm doing. See, I don't care because, uh, you know, I have no standing in academia. I have no career, you know. <laughs> I, I, I don't have any of these things to lose. But anybody else that's in a, in a you know, category of being a public figure if they should dare embrace what I'm doing and give me the satisfaction and give me that wow factor, they could be at risk for losing everything, you know, including being ridiculed and people don't like being ridiculed. I've been a follower of Mayor Baba for 45 years. And one of the things you learn as a follower of Mayor Baba is that a little bit of humble pie is good for you. It's, it's a necessary part of your diet. You know, like when I leave some stupid white cream in my ear and, don't button my shirt sleeve and stuff like that, you know. Well, it means that you can handle ridicule. You know, it's like, okay, that's fine. You know, because I've had 45, 45 years of practice of occasionally being in humiliating situations. And eventually you get better at it, you know. <laughs> so I have that qualification too. But most people don't. So these people that are high up in the world's estimation or in academia if they dare come out for me and they're ridiculed, that's devastating for them, you know. So I think that's a big part of it. Well, I think I've talked enough. I don't know. Maybe this is worth posting. And anybody obviously can watch as much of this or any of the others as they see fit. I had actually thought to present some more evidence, you know, just to show how this big tapestry, I find a piece of evidence over here and a piece of evidence over here and one over here that nobody would ever think to tie together. And when I pull them together, it shows something very interesting, you know. Well, I might do that and I might not. It involves Abby and her history, and I'm a little sensitive about presenting her history to general audience. And uh, I also kind of want to stick with these major plagiarists, with Dickens and Poe and Margaret Fuller, you know, and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. I kind of want to stick with them so that everything kind of relates to that, you know. Because this is my spearhead. This is the thing that I hope is going to get in somehow or other. Um, so when the fake Ethan Spike or ostensibly fake Ethan Spike story comes in, it's still on its way. I don't know what could have held it up in a little town in Pennsylvania as long as it did. But uh, officially now it's on its way. It might get here Monday. I don't know. Then I'll go ahead and take time out just to show in real time, you know, we'll explore that in real time. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And if I'm right, I'm right. And we'll just see, you know, I like to do that. And I want to demonstrate to people that I'm rigorous, that I'm, that my work is falsifiable, which means that I could admit if it was wrong, I would know it was wrong. And you would know it was wrong. And I would admit that it was wrong. And I tell you, um, on the other hand, if it's right, I'll tell you that. So, that kind of ties into these major plagiarists because I'm using the same techniques there. You know, if I'm wrong about something in my paper in Charles Dickens, I admitted I was wrong about something, you know, right in smack in the middle of the paper. I admitted I was mistaken about something. So I will do that. And I want to demonstrate that, but I kind of want to be around the periphery of these major discoveries concerning these major plagiarists. And with that, I'll sign off, and the next time I see you may be when I have the fake Ethan Spike.